Chapter 6 of The Intelligence of School Children by Lewis Terman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 6 Individual Differences in the First Year of High School. Noting that a third or more of the pupils who enter high school do not remain to begin the second year of work, Proctor decided to attack the problem at its most critical point by investigating the abilities of first-year students. The aim of the study was, one, to find out how greatly first-year pupils differ in intelligence, two, to trace the dependence of school success upon intelligence as measured by the tests, three, to find what relation exists between intelligence and elimination, and four, to investigate the possible value of intelligence tests in educational and vocational guidance. All the pupils who entered the Palo Alto, California High School during the school year of 1916-17 to were given a Stanford Bennett test. The number in this group was 107. The testing was continued the following year, in part with the Stanford Bennett and in part by the use of the modified form of the Otis Group Scale. Altogether, intelligence measurements were made of approximately 850 first-year pupils in seven different high schools and of 250 pupils in the eighth grade. The purpose of the study was not merely to discover individual differences, but also to discover what bearings these have upon educational guidance. It was therefore necessary to check up the test results in as many ways as possible. Supplementary data secured at the time the tests were given included nationality, age, school marks in all the subjects, vocational ambition, occupation of father, and teacher's estimates of intelligence. What was still more important, Proctor followed up the cases over a period of two years in order to note any changes that might occur in the quality of the schoolwork and to correlate school success with the test results. As typical of his findings, we will present in this chapter some of the results of the Stanford Bennett tests of 137 pupils who had just entered the Palo Alto High School. In every respect, the results secured by the Bennett tests were closely paralleled by the group measured of more than 700 additional pupils. Age differences. The age range was from 13.0 to 19.3, with a median of 14.11. The median age for a thousand unselected pupils entering New York high schools was 14.5. The median for 1,042 in Iowa City, 14.9. While these age differences are of interest, they do not necessarily furnish ground for criticism of school grading. Far from maintaining that children ought to be graded more by age than they are, it is one of the main purposes of this book to show that grading is based too much upon age. As will be seen presently, the oldest of these pupils are mentally far below the ability necessary for success in the first year of high school, while the youngest are invariably retarded one or more grades below the level of their mentality. Mental Age Differences in our discussion of mental ages of high school pupils, it is necessary to point out that mental ages secured by the Stanford Binet above 14 or 15 years have something of an arbitrary meaning. No one knows exactly what median intelligence is for the ages 15, 16, 17, etc., because it is practically impossible to secure unselected subjects above 14 years. By that age, the pupils of inferior ability begin to drop out of school. Accordingly, when we speak of the mental age 16, 17, etc., we are using these figures rather as scores than as mental ages in the literal sense. We simply know that 16 denotes a higher mental level than 15, 17 higher than 16, 18 higher than 17. With this understanding, however, we will continue to employ the term mental age as in preceding chapters. The mental age scores of the 137 high school freshmen ranged from 12.8 to 19.6, the latter being the highest possible on the Stanford Binet. The lowest was carried by a girl whose chronological age was 19.3, the highest by a boy whose chronological age was 13.8. Figure 18 shows the percent of total number at each mental age. Only four of the 137 pupils were below the mental age of 13 and a half years. All of these were overage, retarded pupils. It appears that but for the tendency of teachers to promote on the basis of age rather than on the basis of ability, there would be few, if any, pupils in this high school much below the mental level of 14 years. On the other hand, of the 31 pupils who have a mental age score of 17 or above, 26 are less than 15 and a half years of age.
the median mental age of the 137 pupils is 1510. A graph is also displayed on this page with figure 18, mental age distribution of 137 first year high school pupils. The highest mental age in Hubbard's fifth grade classes, 15-3, not only overlaps those of the first year high school, but almost reaches the median for the latter. However, the lowest mental age in the high school group, 12-8, is not nearly as low as the median for the fifth grade. If we consider the mental age, 14-5 to 15-5, to be that normal for the first year of high school, then 27, or 20%, 20 are mentally below the standard mental age for the grade and 80, or 58%, are above. There are 41 pupils, or 30%, above the mental age of 16 and a half, and 22, or 16%, above the mental age of 17 and a half. It could perhaps hardly be maintained that all of these 22 ought to be doing the work of the junior year, as this work is now constituted, but one is attempted to raise the question whether high school curricula are not framed for a higher level of mental ability than is justifiable. Mental age and school marks. Is success in high school largely determined by mental age, as was found to be the case in the first and fifth grades? The answer will be found in Table 11, which shows the correlation between mental age and average school work for the 111 pupils who are still in school. Table 11 is displayed on the page. Relation between school marks and mental age. Correlation 0.45. The correlation is moderately high but considerably lower than is found in the grades below the high school. The following facts are, however, very significant. 1. Of the five pupils with an average mark of A, not one is below the mental age score of 17 years. 2. Of the 28 whose average score is B+, plus, not one is below the mental age of 15 years. 3. Of the 56 who earned a mental age score as high as 16 and a half years, only 8 have an average mark below B. 4. Of the 12 with a mental age below 14 and a half, 8 earned an average mark of C or lower. 5. The only pupils tested whose mental ages were below 13 and a half years for a number had already been eliminated because of failure and so did not appear in Table 10. Throughout Proctor's study, it appears that the standards of work which are maintained in the first year of average California high schools cannot be satisfactorily met by pupils with a Stanford Binet mental age below 13 years, and that below the mental age of 14 years, the chances of success are not good. In rare instances, the pupils of 12-year mental age is able to make passing grades, but only by virtue of exceptional application and an attractive personality. Intelligence Quotients for the group of 107 pupils entering in September 1916, the IQs ranged from 79 to 136 with a median of 105. The lowest 25% fell to 96 or below, the highest 25% reached 117 or above. The median for the boys was 107, for the girls 102. The distribution of IQs is shown as figure 19. The most striking thing about the distribution is that only three cases appear below 85 and only eight cases below 90. Above 90, the number of cases increases with marked suddenness, indicating that entrance to this high school is pretty well barred to children whose test much below 90. Figure 19 is displayed, IQ distribution of first year high school pupils. Except for the smaller number in the lower range, the distribution of IQs of the first year high school pupils is similar in form to that found in the lower grades. However, the Stanford Binet probably grades a trifle severely at the upper end, as is shown elsewhere. An IQ of 130 in the case of a child of 15 years is probably equivalent to an IQ of 140 for a child under 12. Even so, the range of IQs from 79 to 138 is very great. IQ and Chronological Age there was found, as would naturally be expected, a high negative correlation, minus 0.74, between IQ and chronological age, which of course simply means that the children who enter high school young are generally brighter than those who enter late. Table 12 is displayed, showing negative correlation between age and IQ, correlation negative 0.72. As is shown in Table 12, no pupil below 13 and a half years tested lower than 120. Of the 30 pupils below 14 and a half years of age, not one tested lower than 100, and only two lower than 110. 
it is evident that to enter this high school on scheduled time ordinarily requires decidedly better than average intelligence on the other hand of the thirty-eight pupils who were above the age of fifteen and a half only eleven tested as high as one hundred and only two as high as one hundred and ten these thirty-eight pupils constitute the retarded group again indicating that the chief cause of retardation is mental inferiority of the thirty-eight seventy per cent are below one hundred i q as we have already stated the lowest i q was that of a girl who was over nineteen the negative correlation between age and brightness is further illustrated by the scores made in the vocabulary test table thirteen shows in general the largest vocabularies are possessed by the youngest pupils the smallest vocabularies by the oldest pupils the positive correlation of vocabulary with mental age is shown in table fourteen for comparison table thirteen is displayed on the page vocabulary and age correlation negative point four table fourteen is displayed on the page vocabulary and mental age correlation positive point six five six i q and schoolwork the correlation between i q and schoolwork was somewhat higher than between mental age and schoolwork point five four five as against point four four while the disagreements were fairly numerous most of them could be accounted for by such factors as health attendance degree of application and attitude toward work often it was the test which disagreed most with quality of schoolwork that contributed most to an understanding of the pupil in general however schoolwork rose and fell with i q as is shown by tables fifteen and sixteen table fifteen is displayed average i q for different school marks where's three columns on the page school marks of fifty to fifty nine average i q eighty five number of cases twelve school marks sixty to sixty nine average i q one hundred number of cases sixteen school marks seventy to seventy nine average i q one hundred and seven number of cases fifty six school marks eighty to eighty nine average i q one hundred and ten number of cases twenty four school marks ninety to ninety nine average i q one hundred and twenty three number of cases four uh, table sixteen is also displayed average school mark for different i q's three columns with i q average mark and number of cases i q seventy five to eighty four average mark sixty three number of cases two i q eighty five to ninety four average mark seventy two number of cases seventeen i q ninety five to one hundred and four average mark seventy four number of cases twenty eight i q one hundred and five to one hundred and fourteen average mark seventy six number of cases twenty four i q one hundred and fifteen to one hundred and twenty four average mark eighty one number of cases nineteen i q one hundred and twenty five and over average mark eighty three number of cases twelve iq and teachers estimates of intelligence the teachers were asked to estimate the intelligence of each pupil on the usual scale of one two three four five for one hundred and two pupils the ratings were made by at least three teachers the ratings for each child were then averaged to secure a composing rating the teachers did not confer with one another in making the ratings nor did they know the results of the tests the correlation of the composite ratings with iqs is shown in table seventeen table seventeen is displayed showing agreement between i q and teachers ratings on intelligence correlation point five nine the correlation is fairly high it would have been considerably higher but for the fact that the overage children were rated too high the underage children too low the tendency of teachers is to base their estimates of intelligence on the quality of the work paying too little attention to age or degree of application the correlation between the teacher's ratings and the class marks was point seventy there were eight pupils below ninety five i q who received an intelligence rating of average all but two of these were above the median chronological age of the class although the teacher's ratings were made independently of each other there proved to be an average correlation of point six seven seven between the ratings of one teacher and those of another this would indicate that all the teachers based their estimates of intelligence on much the same thing, namely quality of school work. Relation of intelligence to elimination. 
Of the 107 who entered the Palo Alto High School in 1916-17, all of whom were tested, there were 27 who did not re-enter the following year. 14 of these had transferred to other schools and 13 had left school to go to work. The IQs of the latter group were 79, 83, 85, 87, 90, 92, 97, 97, 101, 105, 106, 115. The boy with an IQ of 115 had left only temporarily on account of family finances. Ten of the thirteen were below the median IQ for the class, 105. The average IQ of the fourteen who transferred to other schools was 110. The average of the thirteen who dropped out was 94. Seven of the thirteen had received marks denoting failure in more than half their school work. Plainly, most of these pupils did not really quit school to go to work. They went to work out of school because they could not do the work in school. Had there been a better understanding of the degree of mental ability necessary for success in certain studies, fewer eliminations would have resulted. In this high school, at least, the pupil with IQ below 90 is practically certain to fail in such studies as algebra and Latin. For purposes of educational guidance, it will be necessary to establish the lower limits of intellectuality necessary for success in the various high school subjects. Other evidence that elimination is selective. In the average American city, not more than 40% of the pupils who enter the first grade remain to enter high school, and ordinarily not more than 10% graduate from the high school. Smaller cities make somewhat better records, but it is an exceptional school system that graduates from the high school as many as one-fifth of its children. In the case of 318 cities of all sizes studied by Strayer, the central tendency was for about 37% to enter the first year of high school, 25% to enter the second year, 17% to the third year, and 14% the fourth year. The 58 cities studied by Ayres and the 23 studied by Thorndike made a considerably lower record, particularly in the third and fourth high school grades. It is not uncommon for one-third to drop out without completing the work of the first year. Not all of this elimination is traceable to inferior mental ability, but that a large part is due to this cause, there is no longer room for doubt. Van Denberg studied the school records of 1,000 representative children who went to the first year of high school in New York City. Of these 1,000 pupils represented a rather highly selected group is shown by the fact that although only one pupil in 23 in the elementary schools of New York gained special promotion, one-third of those who entered high school had done so. We have already seen that pupils who enter high school considerably retarded are almost invariably pupils of inferior ability and that those who enter underage are exceptionally bright. Remembering this, it is interesting to note that Van Denberg found that pupils who entered late are very much less likely to graduate than those who enter young. The same result was found for Iowa City over a period of 10 years. Table 18 shows the graduation expectancy of pupils who entered at various ages. Table 18 is displayed. Graduating expectancy of pupils entering high school at various ages. Three columns displayed. Age of entrance, Iowa City percent and New York percent. Age 12-13, Iowa City 65%, New York 23%. Age 13-14, Iowa City 50%, New York 19%. Age 14-15, Iowa City 39%, New York 10%. Age 15-16, Iowa City 29%, New York 6.5%. Age 16-17, Iowa City 17%, New York 3.5%. Even when the late entrant remains to graduate, he normally requires more than four years to do so. For example, King found that only 13% of those entering at 16 graduate in four years, and only 9% of those entering at 17. Van Denberg's 1,000 pupils were rated by their teachers on ability shortly after they entered upon the first semester's work. Three grades were used, high, average, and low. Of those rated low, 50% were dropped down in one half year or less. Of those rated average, 50% dropped out within one and one half years. Of those rated high, 50% remained for three years or more. The marks given these pupils at the end of the first term proved also 
to have great value as an index of future elimination. The median expectancy for those securing various marks was as follows. Average first term's mark, percent, is displayed in one column, and time during which 50% remain in schools is displayed in the second column. Average of first term's marks, 0 to 49%. Time during which 50% remain in school, half a year. Average of first term's marks, 50 to 59%. Time during which 50% remain in school, one year. Average of first term's marks, 60 to 69%. Time during which 50% remain in school, one and a half years. Average of first term's marks, 70 to 79%. Time during which 50% remain in school, two and a half years. Average of first term's marks, 80 to 100%. Time during which 50% remain in school, four years. There can be but one conclusion from the facts like those we have just cited. High school elimination is very selective. Although there are many individual exceptions, the pupils who drop out are the main pupils of inferior ability. The high school offers little which can be done by pupils of much less than average intelligence. Are high school standards too high? It would seem that if the pupils of inferior ability are to be retrained in the high school, it will have to be do one of two things. Either one, lower the standards in the present courses, or two, add other studies which are easier while at the same time educationally worthwhile. It may be that we have judged the high school too exclusively by the difficulty pupils encounter in meeting its standards for graduation. Largely through the influence of the university, the bars have been raised until graduation is well beyond the intellectual endowment of a large proportion of children. Below 90 IQ, graduation is by no means likely, and nearly a third of all children test this low or lower. Proctor found that 70% of those testing below 95 IQ failed in more than half of their studies. A nation falls short of the true ideals of democracy, which refuses to furnish suitable training to a third of its children merely because their endowment does not enable them to complete a course of study which will satisfy the requirements for college entrance. There was a time when those whose ability would not carry them through algebra or Latin could turn with some hope of success to the modern languages or to science. In proportion as these studies became established, they too raised their requirements. When the commercial subjects were brought into the high school curriculum, these in turn became the dumping ground for failures. However, the teachers of commercial subjects were not long in discovering that there is no demand in stenography or bookkeeping for commercial graduates of inferior ability. At present, other lines of vocational training are being introduced into the high school and the pupils who cannot succeed in the older subjects are turning to these. Whether the solution will be found, there will depend largely on the variety of courses the high school undertakes to offer and on whether it is willing to forgo the semi-collegiate standards in favour of a humbler task. High schools at present are in a measure class schools. The child of 75 to 85 IQ has an inalienable right to the kind of training for which he can derive profit. Since there are so many who cannot master the usual high school studies, new lines of work of a more practical nature will have to be added. Since there are probably 10% who have not even the ability to complete the work preparatory to high school, the differentiation of courses will have to begin in the 6th or 7th grade. Instead of being undemocratic, as some have argued, such differentiation of courses and enlargement of opportunities for vocational training of the humbler sort is a necessary corollary of the truly democratic ideal. End of chapter 6 of The Intelligence of School Children Read by Leon Harvey Chapter 7 of The Intelligence of School Children by Lewis Terman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 7 The Mental Age Standard for Grading. The IQ does not itself tell us in what grade a pupil belongs. A child testing at 75 IQ and another testing at 125 may be equally ready for work of fourth grade difficulty, provided the chronological age of the former is 13 and that of the later 8. Each would thus have a mental age of approximately 10 years. The basis of grading is therefore mental age rather than IQ. The latter is merely an index of brightness. 
it is extremely significant because it enables us to forecast a child's later mental development but grade of work which a pupil can do at any given time depends rather upon the absolute mental level there is a slight correction to add to this statement to a certain extent iq differences do affect the quality of school work which a given mental age may do in the illustration given above it is altogether likely that the eight-year child of 125 IQ will do somewhat better work in the fourth grade than in the 13-year child of 75 IQ, even though they have the same mental age. The greater intellectual spontaneity of the young, bright child somewhat outweighs the advantage which the older but mentally inferior child has in age and school training. Normal mental age for the different grades. The child is expected to start to school between the ages of six and seven years. Although many start later and some younger, the average entrance age in most parts of the United States is not far from six and a half. Breaking on this basis, the standard mental age for the different grades would be as follows. Small tables displayed on the page with grade and standard mental age. Grade 1, 6 to 6, 2, standard mental age, 7, 5, or approximately 7 years. Grade 2, 7, 6, 2, 8, 5, standard mental age, or approximately eight years grade three eight six to standard mental age nine five or approximately nine years grade four nine six to standard mental age ten five or approximately ten years grade five ten six to standard mental age eleven five or approximately eleven years grade six eleven six to standard mental age 12 5 or approximately 12 years grade 7 12 6 to standard mental age 13 5 or approximately 13 years grade 8 13 6 to standard mental age 14 5 or approximately 14 years high school 1 14 6 to standard mental age 15 5 or approximately 15 years etc Children who are in the grades corresponding to these standards are in the large majority of cases found doing work of average quality. If the mental age is much above or below the norms just indicated, the school work is usually correspondingly superior or inferior. Table 19 shows the percent of children rated as superior, average or inferior who are in the grade corresponding to mental age, 1,936 cases. It is seen that the mental age norms we have given fit the difficulty of work in the different grades fairly closely. There is a slight tendency, however, for children of the mental age 6 6 to 7 5 to do better than average work in grade 1, and for those of mental age 13 6 to 14 5 to do below average work in grade 8. This is what should be expected since the average mental and chronological ages for grade 1 are a little below 7 years, and those of grade 8 are a little above 14 years. In the first year of high school, the child of standard mental age finds it still more difficult to do average work. The median mental ages actually found in the eight grades in the first year of high school are as follows. A table is displayed with three rows coming across with grade, cases tested, and median mental age. Grade one, 341 cases tested, median mental age, 610, Grade 2, 189 cases tested. Median mental age, 711. Grade 3, 181 cases tested. Median mental age, 90. Grade 4, 253 cases tested. Median mental age, 911. Grade 5, 226 cases tested. Median mental age, 110. Grade 6, 236 cases tested. Median mental age, 12 1. Grade 7, 193 cases tested, median mental age 13 1. Grade 8, 180 cases tested, median mental age 14 2. High school 1, cases tested 137, median mental age 15 4. A table 19 is also displayed on the same page showing quality of school work done by children who are in a grade corresponding to mental age. So far, we have shown that the child of standard mental age for a given grade tends to do average work in that grade. It remains to show that if the mental age is above or below the standard, the school work tends to be superior or inferior to the average. 
of the 1,936 children appearing in the above table, 120 were two or more years above the grade normal to their mental age. This is 6.2% of the entire number. Of the 120, not one was rated as doing superior work, and only 19 as doing average work. The remaining 101 were rated as doing work of inferior or very inferior quality. Of the 1,936, there were 234 who were located in the grade two or more years below the standard for their mental age. Of these, 52% were rated above average in schoolwork, 33% average, and 15% below average. Summarizing, we can say that while children located in a grade two years above mental age are rarely able to do average work, there are somewhat more in a grade two years below mental age whose schoolwork is not satisfactory. The child with mental age more than equal to his work may yet fail because of illness, lack of application, or for any of a number of reasons. On the other hand, exceptional industry can rarely make good the disadvantage which a child suffers whose mental age is two or three years below the grade standard. Sources of Error in Judging School Success The agreement of school performance with mental age standards would doubtless have been closer if all the teachers who rated their children had been infallible judges of the quality of school work. If the work of a given grade had always been of the same difficulty, and if all had taken the terms average, superior, and inferior in exactly the same sense, all of these sources of error are serious, especially the last. As we have pointed out so many times, each teacher tends to take as her rating standard the average work actually being done in her class. If her class has a disproportionate number of dull pupils, she tends to rate too high. The reverse, if her class as a whole, is exceptionally bright. Ratings on schoolwork are also likely to be influenced by the personal traits of the individual children. Traits which tend to cause overrating are vivacity, responsiveness, talkativeness, self-confidence, good looks, neatness, application and conscientiousness. The child who is vivacious and self-confident but parrot-like and superficial is almost sure to be overrated. The stolid appearing or quiet and timid child to be underrated. The child who does his work neatly and conscientiously is likely to be rated more leniently than the child who is slovenly, careless or disobedient. The child whose hearing or speech is defective is also at a disadvantage in such comparative ratings. Errors of this kind, however, are not sufficient to account for the fact that only 40 to 60 percent of school pupils are located in the grade corresponding to mental age. Perhaps an even more frequent cause of incorrect rating is a tendency of teachers to promote children by age, resulting in over-promotion of the dull and under-promotion of the bright. The teacher does not ordinarily realize how far the dull, over-aged child has been promoted beyond the grade where he could do average work. She is still farther from knowing that the typical underage bright child would be in a majority of cases continue to do satisfactory work if promoted one or two grades. However, there are occasional discrepancies between mental age and school performance which cannot be traced either to errors in rating or to mechanical methods of promotion. The quality of a child's schoolwork depends in part upon other factors than intelligence, among which are health, regularity of attendance, degree of application, attitude towards teacher, emotional stability, amount of encouragement at home, etc. The effect of most of these extraneous factors is to make school performance less satisfactory than the mental age would lead us to expect. Discrepancies between mental age and school performance For several years, in connection with Binet tests made by many Stanford University students, we have investigated those cases in which a marked disagreement was found between mental age and school performance. The findings would fill a long and interesting chapter, but the results of a single series of tests will acquaint the reader with the common types of cases. We will select for this purpose the investigation of Miss Preston, who made a study of the disagreements found in tests of 238 pupils in the eight grades at the Santa Clara, California Grammar School. The pupils tested constituted about a third of those enrolled in the school and were selected so as to be as nearly as possible representative. Most of them had also been given the Trebu B and C completion tests and the Army mental test. In addition, each child was rated by the class teacher on each of the following social status, schoolwork, intelligence, dependability, and social adaptability. Miss Preston had been for 10 years principal of the school in which the tests were made and had known all the children personally from the time they first entered. Her acquaintance with parents and home conditions was also of great advantage.
It was found that in the great majority of cases, the result of the Stanford Binet test agreed remarkably well with the child's school work, particularly when the quality of work for a period of years was made the basis of the comparison. The 238 tests yielded only 34 discrepancies worthy of note, and many of these were not large. In 29 of the 34 cases, the quality of school work as rated by the teacher was poorer than the mental age would seem to warrant, and in only five cases better. Where discrepancy of the latter kind occurred, it was ordinarily due either to exceptional application on the part of the child or to the effect of vivacity, responsiveness, or other favorable personal traits in influencing the teacher's judgment. On the other hand, discrepancy in the direction of inferior work resulted from a variety of causes, including timidity, lack of self-confidence, physical defects, lack of application, emotional instability, psychopathic hereditary, home spoiling, love affairs, etc. In the following pages, we present Miss Preston's brief description of the salient features of typical cases of discrepancy. The ratings given by the teacher were in this experiment based on a scale of seven, as follows. 1. Very superior. 2. Superior. 3. Above average. 4. Average. 5. Below average. 6. Inferior. 7. Very inferior. Showing effect of unusual application. Ernest. Age 15 zero, Mental age 12-3. IQ 82. Eighth grade. Quality of work 5. Portuguese. Social status 5. Teacher's ratings. Intelligence 5. Social adaptability 3. Dependability 3. Discrepancy. The mental age is a year and a half below that normal for the eighth grade, but the work is passing, though below average. Ernest's teachers agree that the test has rated his intellectual ability correctly. It happens, however, that his most characteristic trait is one which escapes an intelligence scale. Ernest is an erect little fellow with a straightforward look, who works with all his might at anything he attempts to do. No other pupil in the school equals him in application. He often reaches school ten minutes after seven o'clock in order to study his history lessons until nine. First he reads and re-reads his lesson in an attempt to get the meaning, then he writes it. After that he says it aloud over and over. When the other children begin to arrive he hauls one of them in to hear him recite it and have him explain what some of the words mean. In class, Ernest is a living question mark. What does it mean by those words? Does it mean this? He is oblivious to the teacher's impatience and to the amusement caused among his fellow pupils. There is no escape from his questions. Even as the line files in or out, his teacher gets, What does this mean? as he marches by. When Ernest does a thing, he does it thoroughly, in school or out. He is captain of the baseball team and does a vigorous job of it. Showing effect of child's personality on the teacher's ratings. Jenny, age 12, mental age 10 8 IQ 89 6th grade quality of work 2 American social status 3 teachers ratings intelligence 2 social adaptability 2 dependability 2 discrepancy superior work in a grade which is more than a year above a mental age Jenny attracts attention by her smiling vivacious face and sparkling eyes she is alert quick in movement but without self-consciousness in conversation she is responsive eager and reflects your every expression in class her eye never leaves the teacher's face and she follows every explanation with intent eagerness all of this naturally influences the teacher's estimate of her intelligence and schoolwork donald age twelve zero mental age sixteen eight i q one hundred thirty nine sixth grade quality of work two american social status three teacher's ratings intelligence two social adaptability two dependability two Discrepancy. The mental age would indicate ability to do high school work, but Donald is only in the sixth grade. However, his work in this grade is superior and is probable that he would be able to do satisfactory work in a higher grade. Donald is chiefly of interest in comparison with Jenny described above. The two are of almost exactly the same age and are both doing superior work in the sixth grade. Jenny, however, is barely average normal in intelligence, while Donald tests at 139. This difference is confirmed by the Tribu test and also by the Army test.
In personality, Donald presents a striking contrast to Jenny. Her responsiveness and vivacity are fully matched by his apparent stolidity and shyness. Donald talks only in monosyllables. He has been so thoroughly suppressed at home by a severe father that he is shrinking and timid. When successful in drawing him out, one finds a highly sensitive nature of rare sweetness and poetic feeling, but the least stirs sends him shrinking back to each shell with a hurt air and a suspicious glance. He also has no self-confidence, never expresses his feelings, and avoids doing anything that could possibly attract attention. Claire Age 9-10, mental age 12-7, IQ 128, fourth grade, quality of work 2, American, social status 4, teacher's ratings, intelligence 2, social adaptability 2, dependability 1. Discrepancy, mental age 2 years above her grade. However, her schoolwork is superior and she could probably do the work in the next higher grade. The fact that she has had one extra promotion agrees with a high intelligence quotient. Claire is slow in her movements and slow in finishing assigned tasks. She is diffident, hesitating in speech, and waits for approval. Her teacher seldom realizes, until review time, how thoroughly Claire gets her work. Showing effect of timidity and lack of self-confidence. Clifford, age 8-5, mental age 8-6, IQ 101. Third grade, quality of work 5, American, social status 4, teacher's ratings, intelligence 4, social adaptability 4, dependability 4. Discrepancy. In grade corresponding to mental age, but his work until last year barely passing. Clifford has no self-confidence. His mother speaks in his presence of his stupidity and compares him disparagingly with his bright older brother. Hard to get him to try but his work has recently shown improvement. Louise, age 9-1, mental age 10-6, IQ 115, fourth grade, quality of work 6, American, social status 3, teacher's ratings, intelligence 4, social adaptability 4, dependability 3. Discrepancy, school work inferior, although mental age would indicate ability for the fourth grade. Louise is timid, and easily worn out by excitement, likely to appear bewildered when placed in a group, is dominated by an older sister whom she worships, but who has reached an irritable stage in her development. Louise cannot please her in any way, although her endeavours are constant. Showing effect of mental inertia. Leonard, age 13-6, mental age 13-10. IQ 103, 7th grade, quality of work 6. American, social status 5, teacher's ratings, intelligence 5, social adaptability 5, dependability 5. Discrepancy. Both chronological age and mental age normal for grade, but schoolwork has always been decidedly inferior. Leonard's father, now dead, was a shiftless drunkard. The mother, ostensibly a nurse, leads an immoral life. Several cousins are feeble-minded. Leonard's smiling good nature and constitutional indolence are proverbial among his teachers. One wonders whether he ever did anything he was not compelled to do. In school he sits smiling pleasantly at others, or staring off into space, dreaming. When prodded by the teacher, he opens his book and stares into it vacantly. Perhaps the book is upside down. Occasionally he wakes up and gives a clear, fluent account of something he has read or seen, but he soon lapses again into his customary state of oblivion. Showing effects of emotional instability or nervous tendencies. Olivia, age 12-6, mental age 13-2, IQ 105, 7th grade, quality of work 6, Portuguese, social status 4, teacher's ratings, intelligence 5, social adaptability 4, dependability 4. Discrepancy. Up to grade age mentally and chronologically, Olivia has been promoted on trial from almost every grade. Of Portuguese parents, whose heads have been turned by prosperity, the mother says in her presence that Olivia has inherited her own nervousness and inability to do arithmetic. Needless to say, Olivia is nervous and cannot do arithmetic. She flounces around at her lessons, adds a bit, jiggles her desk, drops her books, picks them up, caresses her curls, etc. 
when in trouble pretends to be about to faint but quickly recovers if threatened with punishment emotional instability fully explains the discrepancy between intelligence and school success joseph age thirteen ten mental age fifteen nine i q one hundred and fourteen eighth grade quality of school work six american social status five teachers ratings intelligence four social adaptability six dependability six discrepancy mental age above average for grade but school work very unsatisfactory joseph has two sisters who are feeble-minded and blind two of his three brothers also feeble-minded are dead the third brother is a movie star of national fame joseph's mother is a kindly-faced woman who has been deserted by her worthless husband and supports herself by taking and washing joseph himself is a bookworm reading everything he can lay his hand on from sunday school books to encyclopedias his mind is an exhaustless reservoir of unrelated facts psychopathic symptoms suffers at times from the idea of persecution at which times he refuses to do any school work or even to talk effect of home spoiling gordon age five seven mental age six six i q one hundred and sixteen first grade quality of work five american social status three teachers ratings intelligence five dependability five discrepancy school work inferior although in grade correspond to mental age gordon is the son of a minister and badly spoiled from petting and humouring attitude of condescension towards school work attention poor easily fatigued bad sex habits bernard age seven one mental age seven eight i q one hundred and eight first grade quality of work five to six portuguese social status five teachers ratings intelligence four social adaptability four dependability five discrepancy school work below average although mental age is a half year above normal for grade bernard is a handsome child the other five in the same family are very homely has always been petted and allowed to have his own way showing influence of physical defects roy age fifteen mental age fourteen eight i q ninety eight seventh grade quality of work six american social status four teachers ratings intelligence six social adaptability five dependability five discrepancy mental age a little above the average for his grade but school work inferior thin anemic and sickly looking almost hydrocephalic in appearance with protruding eyes and open mouth very deaf and resents it fails to hear much of what is said during recitation but will not admit it at home has been alternatively scolded and petted by foolish mother with the result that he has irritable and stubborn spells madeline age seven ten question mark mental age six two i q seventy nine question mark first grade quality of work seven portuguese social status five teachers ratings intelligence six social adaptability six dependability five discrepancy although there is a question about madeline's correct age her mental age of six plus should enable her to do at least fair work in the first grade she is making almost no progress has suffered for years from cholera attends school until her movements became too uncontrolled and violent stays at home for a few weeks then returns to school after a severe attack all she has learned in school seems to leave her love affairs and daydreaming elmer age fourteen two mental age fourteen three i q one hundred and one seventh grade quality of work six american social status four teachers ratings intelligence five social adaptability three dependability four discrepancy failing in work but with mental age slightly above his school grade the discrepancy in elmer's case was only temporary and was caused by a particularly severe case of puppy love the girl moved away love's young dream was broken and elmer's work came back to normal aldrick age seven five mental age eight six i q one hundred and fifteen second grade quality of work six american social status four teachers ratings intelligence three social adaptability three dependability four discrepancy mental age average for grade but schoolwork inferior a dreamer and not interested in schoolwork 
poor foundation in first grade. Teacher's estimate of intelligence agrees with the IQ. Unusual vocabulary and information. Summary. It appears that a lack of self-confidence, personal traits which tend to cause overrating or underrating, mental inertia, physical defects, emotional instability, and psychopathic heredity are the most common causes of discrepancy between mental age and quality of school work. Unfavorable emotional attitude towards a teacher, the effects of which we have seen in other cases, did not appear in this series. Of the 34 pupils for whom a discrepancy was found, 24 were boys, although as many girls as boys were tested. This would indicate either that teachers oftener misunderstood boys and oftener underrate their schoolwork, or that the school performance of boys is more easily influenced by physical or emotional defects than for girls. It is also interesting to note that although the tests were almost equally divided between children of American and foreign parentage, chiefly Portuguese, the latter account for only 11 of the 34 discrepancies. It appears, therefore, that the fact of foreign parentage does not greatly limit the usefulness of the Stanford Binet scale as a measure of a child's educability. Several other Stanford students have made studies similar to that of Miss Preston's, involving in all nearly 2,000 Binet tests. The data show convincingly that in the large majority of cases, mental age offers a fairly accurate index as to the grade in which the child is fitted to do work of average quality. The index misses the mark to the extent of one grade in something like 6 to 8 percent of cases, to the extent of two grades in not more than 1 or 2 percent of cases. In 90 cases out of 100, it is accurate enough for all practical purposes. Even in those instances where it would be misleading, if taken as a sole criterion, the Binet test offers the best available starting point for reaching an understanding of the child's case. For example, J.F. has been for months doing very inferior work in the first year of high school. The teachers and principals were at a complete loss to understand the case. Various remedies were tried, but without effect. The boy claimed that he was making every effort to do the work. Finally, he was given a Binet test and was found to have a mental age well above that necessary for successful work in the ninth grade. The principal then called the boy to his office, explained to him what the test had revealed regarding his ability, and suggested that it was time for him to quit fooling and get down to earnest work. The result was an immediate and surprising improvement in his class marks. Sometimes the fault lies not so much in lack of application as in failing self-confidence. S.W., a boy of 12 years, had developed a sense of mental inferiority. His schoolwork had gradually deteriorated until he was on the point of failing. Although it is ordinarily not permissible to give a child his Binet test score, the principal wisely decided to do so in this case. The boy was so encouraged by the information that he went to work with a new spirit and soon ranked above the average in his class. Whether the child is working exactly up to his capacity or above or below it, the mental test is equally necessary. Ernest, the first of Miss Preston's cases, is doing fair work, although considerably below the normal mental age for his grade. Unless this is known, Ernest's efforts cannot be correctly appraised. In such cases as Roy or Madeline, the teacher's attention is directed by the test to the possible influence of physical defect upon schoolwork. A discrepancy like that shown by Jenny and Donald calls attention to the danger of overrating the vivacious or underrating the different child. The case of Margaret. The case of Margaret, reported by Strong, offers a classical example of the usefulness of mental tests in discovering the causes of poor school work. Margaret had just failed a promotion from the low fourth grade. She was 11 years old and tested at 11 by the Binet scale. With average normal ability, according to the test, her schoolwork was nevertheless described by teachers as hopeless. Her work in arithmetic and geography were especially poor. From January until May, a small amount of special instruction was given her by one of Dr. Strong's students. Although the special instruction in arithmetic extended over only five months and amounted to a total of only a few hours, Margaret's advancement was from third grade work to fifth grade work, as shown by the Cortes tests. The trouble seems to have been largely one of emotional attitude. When the special instruction began, she was afraid of everything. She could do very little. She knew nothing positively. She held her eyes down, carried herself shrinkingly, was a typical fraidy cat. We started with a thoroughly disheartened child whose enthusiasm and hope were about dead, and who was being taught many things in school without knowing facts 
and principles which should have preceded these things we taught her the fundamentals of arithmetic thus filling in all the gaps in her knowledge of that subject up to the work of a class in doing so we allowed her to see her learning curves the unmistakable objective fact that she was learning made her realize that she could learn aroused her interest gave her fresh enthusiasm and presently there resulted a transformed child as we have seen the transformation affected not only arithmetic but all her studies her carriage and walk her social attitude towards others her entire character from being hopelessly at the bottom of her class she now has a settled determination to lead that class from every indication it appears that the actually brighter children will have to work to keep ahead of margaret End of chapter 7 of The Intelligence of School Children Read by Leon Harvey Chapter 8 of The Intelligence of School Children by Lewis Terman This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey Chapter 8. Mental Tests of School Laggards Since the publication of ARES's book, Laggards in Our Schools, numerous statistical studies have been made showing the large proportion of children who are one, two, three, or more years retarded, and analysing the factors which are responsible for the condition. It has become a matter of common information that more than 10% of the cost of tuition is for repeated instruction that about a fourth of the pupils leave school with not more than a sixth grade education, and that the ranks of the vocationally incompetent are recruited largely from children who in school were over age for their grade. Yet the problem remains. The number of school laggards has decreased but little, and their needs are almost as little provided for as before the campaign in their behalf began. The extent of the problem will be apparent from an examination of typical statistical findings. The number of overage children. Professor Strayer, by a uniform method, secured data on the amount of retardation in 132 cities having a population of more than 25,000. In the 186 cities having a population less than 25,000. His most important results are embodied in Table 20, which show for boys and girls separately the average percent found retarded or accelerated by various amounts. Table 20 is displayed on the page. Retardation, 318 cities. By Strayer. Table 20 shows that approximately one child in three is retarded, and only one in 25 accelerated. More than 5% are retarded three years or more, and nearly 15% two years or more. The actual amount of retardation is even greater than the figures indicate, because a liberal basis on which retardation was computed. The standard adopted by Professor Strayer was that used by ARES. By this standard, a child is considered as making normal progress, even the first grade and not yet eight years old, even the second grade and not yet nine years old, and so on. Although this is the standard on which retardation is nearly always computed, it allows a margin of a half year all along the line. Actually, if the child begins school by the age of six and one half years, and makes normal progress, he will be in the second grade by the age of seven and one half, in the third by the age of eight and one half, etc. Counting retardation on this basis, the figures for Salt Lake City in May 1915 were as follows. Over age one year, 26.7%. Over age two years, 11.2%. Over age three years, 3.7%. Over age four years or more, 1.2%. Total overage, 43.0%. That the retardation evil is not confined to large cities is shown by Strayer's figures for cities under 25,000, also by Berry's, Lurton's, and Morton's statistics for small towns in Michigan, Minnesota, and Nebraska. For 55 cities and villages in Minnesota, the number of children retarded one year or more, a res basis of reckoning, was 30.9%. And in 41 graded schools of the same state, the number was 33.9%. The figures for 96 cities and towns of Nebraska taken together are as follows. Total pupils, 25,449. Retarded one year, 16.3%. Over age 
Retarded two years, 7.6%. Retarded three years, 3.3%. Retarded four years or more, 1.4%. Total retarded, 28.6%. In 227 cities and towns of Michigan, Berry found a total of 24% retarded and 3.4% retarded three years or more. The amount of retardation in rural schools seems to be even greater than in cities and towns. Gaylor found 53.6% of the children in 139 rural schools of the Illinois County at least one year retarded and 28.4% more than one year retarded in eleven small cities in illinois the number retarded two years or more was twenty point seven per cent as compared with twenty eight point four per cent in the rural schools phelps found twenty eight per cent of thirteen thousand six hundred twenty six rural school children in california retarded on the liberal standard used by ares the number retarded three or more years was two point five per cent the supposed causes of retardation retardation cannot be properly dealt with until its causes are understood the causes emphasized by ares and the majority of other investigators are physical defects irregular attendance late entrance too high a standard and lack of flexibility in methods of promotion the usual view was expressed in the following conclusions which dr gulick drew from the investigation of ares one that the most important causes of retardation can be removed. 2. That relatively few children are so defective as to prevent success in school or life. These assumptions are contradicted by the findings of all who have investigated the subject by the use of mental tests. It is interesting to examine the causes which are most often mentioned by teachers and superintendents. In the case of 108 laggards in the Salt Lake City schools, the causes most often named were the following given here in order of frequency of mention by teachers poor home condition physical defects transferring from another school retarded mental development difficulty with the english language lack of application irregular attendance laziness late entrance and delinquency mental tests of these same one hundred and eight children showed an average mental retardation of three years the large majority indeed were feeble-minded feeble-minded children do often come from poor homes since often the parents of feeble-minded children are themselves feeble-minded for the same reason feeble-minded pupils shift frequently from one locality to another and attend irregularly because such children are feeble-minded they enter late show little application to their schoolwork and tend to become delinquent many similar questionnaire studies have been made and their findings are always essentially the same all kinds of supposed causes of retardation are emphasized except the one important cause inferior mental ability one all children are either normal or feeble-minded two those who are normal i e not feeble-minded should make standard school progress three those who are feeble-minded will bear readily recognizable earmarks of their deficiency and will be unable to learn anything it is not generally understood that many feeble-minded children present a normal appearance still less than some ten per cent of school children of perfectly normal appearance have a grade of intelligence which is about halfway between that of the moron and that of the average normal child the real causes of retardation of dixon's first grade pupils who were eight years old or older sixty eight per cent were below eighty i q of hubbard's fifth grade pupils who were thirteen years old or older i e two or more years retarded sixty four per cent were below eighty i q of fifty overage children tested by williams in three california cities fifty per cent had an i q below eighty and thirty two per cent were below seventy five of one hundred seventy four overage children tested in the schools of x county california sixty one were below seventy i q one hundred six below eighty one and one hundred fifty three below ninety in the case of the 1,000 unselected children on whom the Stanford vision was based, 97 were three or more years over age on the ARIS standard. Of these, 78% were below 80 IQ. Conversely, nearly all of those who were below 80 IQ were one or more years over age for the grade in which they were located. Dozens of such studies, larger or smaller, could be quoted. 
it is unnecessary for all show the same thing namely that the overage child is usually a dull child any one who desires additional proof need only test a large number of unselected children of a given chronological age say twelve years and note the school progress which those of various mental ages have made tables twenty one and twenty two show this for unselected children of eleven and twelve years table one is displayed on the page grade location of two hundred sixty three eleven year olds by stanford binet mental age table twenty two is displayed grade location of two hundred fifty seven twelve year olds by stanford binet mental age in the above tables mental age six means five six to six five seven means six six to seven five and so on the tables show that intelligence is the chief factor determining the rate of a child's progress it also shows that the test result gives a fairly reliable indication of the school grade in which a child of a given chronological age will be able to do the work the correlation between mental age and grade is 0.81 for the 11 year olds and 0.855 for the 12 year olds the 257 pupils of the 12 year group belong in the sixth grade broke chronological age however 47 are in the fourth grade or below i.e two or more years retarded all but three of these are mentally below 12 years and all but nine mentally below 11 of the 17 year olds in the seventh or eighth grade two years accelerated all but one are mentally 14 or above similarly for the 11 year olds those who are accelerated show a high mental age those who are retarded test low feeble-minded school children we have seen that the large majority of overage children are below average intelligence such children may be classified as dull borderline or feeble-minded while the feeble-minded group is much the smallest of the three it gives rise to the most difficult educational and social problems what these problems are can best be illustrated by the results of a typical survey of feeble-minded children in a small school system that of x county california will serve the purpose x county enrolls somewhat more than five thousand pupils in its public schools approximately twenty per cent of these attend rural schools having less than three teachers the other eighty per cent are divided not very unequally among a half dozen small cities it was not possible to test all these children nor was it necessary to do so in order to ascertain the approximate number of feeble-minded the plan adopted was to test the suspected cases in all the rural schools of the county and in y city and at the same time to obtain data from all the other cities of the county in such a kind as would indicate whether the proportion of mental deficiency in those cities differed greatly from that found in the schools where mental tests were given the first step was to obtain from the teachers information which would make possible the location of suspected cases at the request of the county each teacher furnished the following data for each pupil enrolled in her class name age grade years in school birthplace and occupation of parents and ratings of the child for intelligence and quality of school work as very superior superior average inferior and very inferior the information thus secured made it possible to eliminate eighty or eighty five per cent of the children from consideration because of their obvious normality in most classrooms it was necessary to test only ten to fifteen per cent of the children in order to avoid the risk of missing any defectives in certain rooms however more were tested the rule followed was to test every child who was rated by the teacher as seriously below average in either school work or intelligence and to test all who were seriously over age for their grade whatever the teacher's rating of the one thousand four hundred and sixty four pupils enrolled in the rural schools and the y city one hundred and seventy four twelve per cent were tested the resulting iqs were as follows iq forty to forty nine three iq fifty to fifty nine thirteen iq sixty to sixty nine forty five iq seventy to seventy nine forty five iq eighty to eighty nine forty eight iq ninety to ninety nine fifteen iq one hundred to one hundred nine four iq one hundred ten up zero the majority of cases falling below seventy may be considered feeble-minded 
the range 70 to 79 is composed largely of border zone cases those between 80 and 89 are practically always normal but dull those between 90 and 109 may be called average normal in the classification of the 174 suspects only those were placed below the border zone group who were rather definitely feeble-minded correspondingly those who were above suspicion of feeble-mindedness were placed above the border zone group on this basis sixty two children or four point twenty four per cent of the enrolment of one thousand four hundred and sixty four were classified as feeble-minded and twenty nine one point nine eight per cent as border zone cases grade progress of the feeble-minded the school progress which the sixty two feeble-minded children of x county were making is shown in table twenty three table twenty three is displayed on the page age grade location of sixty two feeble-minded children in this table as before age six means five six two six five age seven means six six two seven five etc from the facts set forth in the above table one could safely infer even without the aid of mental tests that a majority of these children are very inferior moreover for two reasons the age grade distribution of the children represents their mental status too favorably one the younger feeble-minded have not yet had time to fall below grade the feeble-minded of ages six and seven for example are represented the table as being up to grade two the majority of the feeble-minded are in reality above the grade where they can do satisfactory work this is seen in table twenty four which shows that these children who appear to be so badly retarded are on the basis of mental age greatly accelerated while the average retardation on the basis of chronological age is two point five years the average acceleration on the basis of mental age is two point two years table twenty four is displayed on the page grade distribution of sixty two feeble-minded children by mental age some exceptionally difficult cases the following schools will give an idea of the problems which face some of the teachers of x county rural school a pupils enrolled forty one of these eighteen were so seriously over age and were rated so low by the teacher as to be classed as suspects of the eighteen tested thirteen were feeble-minded and three of borderline intelligence one family furnished six of the feeble-minded another four the school enrolls one pupil in the first grade who is ten years old and has been in that grade for four years two other pupils have completed only two grades in the six years they have attended they are now at the age of thirteen years in the low third grade and are doing unsatisfactory work there another who is sixteen years old and in the seventh grade has only nine-year intelligence his intelligence is barely equal to the fourth grade work rural school b eighty-four pupils three teachers of the twelve children tested as suspects four were feeble-minded five were border zone cases and three were dull normal one family furnished a moron and a borderliner another furnished a moron a borderliner and a dull normal a moron girl in this school has an insane mother the girl is normally attractive in appearance and has reached a stage of adolescence room p city y this is a fourth grade class enrolling thirty nine pupils twenty three of whom are over age for their grade five of these are from three to five years retarded the ages of the thirty nine pupils range from nine years to sixteen years of five suspects tested in this room two were feeble-minded and three border zone cases another the lowest of all according to the teacher's estimate was absent and could not be tested although these three schools represent an extreme situation there are undoubtedly thousands of teachers in the united states whose problem is made fully as difficult by the presence of backward and feeble-minded children sometimes a teacher's position is jeopardized because of her inability to give such pupils the expected mastery of schoolwork often she is penalized and her percentage of failure is much higher than the average everywhere the emphasis is on keeping children up to grade rather than on finding work which is suited to their abilities how many children are feeble-minded in x county the proportion of feeble-minded children is not far from four per cent of the total enrolment fortunately this is an exceptional condition 
The proportion usually found is between 1 and 3 per cent. In a partial survey of mental deficiency in the schools of San Luis Obispo, California, we found 2 per cent of the school children mentally defective. The Stanford tests of 1,000 unselected children in five cities gave 1 per cent below 70 IQ and 2 and 1.5 per cent below 75 IQ. Probably 1 and 1.5 per cent of the 1,000 cases were feeble-minded. Among Dixon's first grade children, the proportion of mental deficiency was very considerably higher than this. Of Hubbard's 79 fifth grade pupils, four tested below 70 IQ. Other investigators in large number have found similar ratios of mental deficiency. After an exceptionally thorough study of feeble-mindedness in the public schools of Oakland, California, Mrs. Hicks classifies 3% of the children of that city as feeble-minded. Dr. McPhee Campbell's survey of a certain district in Baltimore resulted in a classification of 3% as having pronounced mental defect. Dr. Goddard, after a number of investigations in eastern cities, including New York City, estimates that about 2% of the school children in any average city will be found feeble-minded. Strikingly similar results have been found for several rural districts. Dr. Wilhelmine Key, in a study of a county in northeastern Pennsylvania, finds 3.2% of the population mentally defective. In a survey of mental deficiency in Porter County, Indiana, by the United States Public Health Service, 2,185 children were given a Binet test. Approximately 1% were classified as feeble-minded, and another large group as doubtful. A similar investigation was made by the Public States Health Service in Newcastle County, Delaware. Abbreviated mental tests were given to all the 3,793 children enrolled, and on the basis of these tests, the seriously retarded cases were sifted out for a complete Binet test. As a result, 1.8% were classified as being of institutional grade, not counting about a fifth of 1% who were epileptic. We can conclude that on an average two or three children out of a hundred are so poorly endowed in intellectual ability as to render their social competency a matter of extreme doubt. This figure should not be surprising, considering the number of children who are over age three years or more. The following percents on this point are typical. 318 cities, Strayer, over age three years or more, 5.25%, over age four years or more, 1.5%, Salt Lake City Survey Report. Over age 3 or more years, 4.9%. Over age 4 or more years, 1.2%. 96 Nebraska cities and towns, Morton. Over age 3 years or more, 4.7%. Over age 4 years or more, 1.4%. 227 Michigan cities and towns, Berry. Over age 3 years or more, 3%. Over age 4 years or more? Unknown. 13,626 California rural school children. Phelps. Over age 3 years or more? 2.5%. Over age 4 years or more? 1%. X County, California. Terman. Over age 3 years or more? 5.2%. Over age 4 years or more? 2%. Probably 80% of those who are retarded four years or more and 50% of those retarded three years or more are feeble-minded. Many others are feeble-minded who have not attended school long enough to become seriously retarded. In X County, 58% of the feeble-minded were not more than two years over age. Criteria of Mental Deficiency Certain statements made in the preceding discussion may appear to be based on the assumption that all children may be classified as definitely normal in intelligence or definitely feeble-minded. No such assumption, however, has been intended. The distribution of mental ability is continuous, by which is meant that there is no definite line of demarcation between the imbecile, the moron, the dull, and the normal. Each group shades into the other by imperceptible degrees, the number of individuals to be classified as feeble-minded will depend largely on the standard of classification used. When 75 IQ is taken as the dividing line, the number of feeble-minded is about two and a half times as great 
as when 70 IQ is taken. If 65 IQ is used, the ratio of feeble-mindedness is greatly reduced. The different standards employed have given rise to serious disagreements among psychologists as to the proportion of feeble-mindedness in various social groups. The disagreement comes from the fact that the term feeble-mindedness is currently used in two very different senses. In one sense, it refers to the possession of no more than a certain degree of mental, chiefly intellectual, capacity as measured by some objective scale. This is the psychological definition. As commonly employed, the term feeble-minded has reference primarily to those who, because of inherent or early acquired mental weakness, cannot compete on equal terms with their fellows, or cannot manage themselves or their affairs with ordinary prudence. This is the social criterion. These two criteria, the psychological and the social, cannot be used interchangeably for the reason that ability to get on in the world depends upon many things besides absolute mental capacity, such as health, looks, bearing, muscular strength, inherent wealth, sympathetic friends, economic and industrial conditions, the prevailing level of intelligence in those with whom the subject must compete, etc. However, experience shows that, on any reasonable standard as to what constitutes social competency, the outlook for children who test below 70 IQ is anything but favourable. Feeble-mindedness and dullness not curable The classification of school children as feeble-minded or dull can only be valid in case it is found that the individual who tests low at an early age will continue to test low in succeeding years. As is shown in Chapter 9, retests of children after long intervals indicate that a child's brightness or dullness remains surprisingly constant. The following retests are typical. FC, middle grade imbecile, tested as follows. Age 86, mental age 40, IQ 47. Age 108, mental age 54, IQ 50. VJ, high grade moron, tested as follows. Age 86, mental age 60, IQ 71, grade 1. Age 94, mental age 69, IQ 72, grade 2. Age 11, 6, mental age 84, IQ 73, grade 3. Age 12, 4, mental age 810, IQ 72, grade 3. HV, dull normal, tested as follows. Age 11, 0, mental age 8, 10, IQ 80.5, grade 4. Age 14, 11, mental age 11, 8, IQ 78, grade low 7. Great expectancy of the feeble-minded. Because of the tendency of the IQ to remain constant, it is possible to forecast, with a reasonable degree of accuracy, the highest grade in which a dull or feeble-minded child will ever be able to do satisfactory work. It has been found that after the chronological age of 15 or 16 years, the mental age increases little, if at all, making allowance for minor changes of a few points in IQ, we are able, on this basis, to make such predictions as the following. The child who tests at 60 IQ will in all probability never go beyond the mental age of 9 or 10 years. 60% of 16 years equals 9.6 years. Such a child will never be able to do good work above the 3rd or 4th grade, although by the age of 16 he is likely to be found in the 5th or 6th grade, promoted there because of his age and size. The child who tests at 70 IQ may ultimately reach a mental age of about 11 years, which corresponds roughly to median 5th grade ability. Such a child by the age of 16 may be able to do fair work in the 6th grade after much repetition, but is likely to be carried by the lockstep of the school a couple of grades beyond this. However, we have found no IQ of 70 in the high school. An IQ of 80 means an ultimate mental age of approximately 12 and one half years. A child of the 80 class will, at best, be able, by the time mental growth has ceased, to do fair or average work in the 7th grade. A mechanical system of promotion and sympathy for his retarded condition may be expected to land him in the 8th grade, or if he remains in school long enough, even in the first or second year of the high school. However, such a child will never be able to do the work of the average high school with any degree of satisfaction. 
The child who tests at 90 is near enough the average to make normal or almost normal progress through the eight grades, although there is some likelihood of his incurring retardation for a half year to a year. Such a child, if persistent, may also be expected to graduate from high school, although the difficulty of making normal progress there is somewhat greater than in the grades below the high school, due to the fact that his competitors in the high school are selected pupils. Those testing between 70 and 80, about 5% of all children, compose a group which offers the most difficult educational problem. The majority of this group are not sufficiently subnormal to warrant their commitment to an institution, nor are they able to profit normally from the regular work of the school. They furnish the bulk of those who, by the age of 12 or 15, are 2 to 4 grades retarded. As noticeably overage pupils, they are the object of everyone's sympathy. Because of the universal desire to keep the retardation figures low, they are overpromoted to such an extent that they are rarely able to master their lessons. Table 29 and 30, page 159 to 160, show the grade location of children testing between 70 and 79. Practically, the only pupils in these tables doing satisfactory work were those who were in a grade correspondingly close to the mental age. Those whose grade location corresponded to chronological age were almost never doing work of average quality for the grade. Limitations of the special class The remedy which has been most often urged for the ills of the overage child is the special class. Although one or more such classes are to be found in nearly all the larger cities, the number is never sufficient to take care of more than a small fraction of the children who should attend them. To provide special teachers enough for all the seriously overage children on the usual basis of 12 or 15 pupils per teacher is quite out of the question. The most that the best cities have done is only a beginning. Even if the special class were as effective educationally as its most enthusiastic champions claim, it would still be an impossible solution of the problem because of the prohibitive cost. Moreover, the question inevitably arises whether the ultimate returns to society would not be greater if any funds available beyond those necessary for the support of the regular classes were used to provide special opportunity for children who are gifted. One way to reduce the cost of special class instruction, which at present is about three times as high as in the regular class, is to establish central schools exclusively for backward children. When the pupils are graded according to ability and type of defect, a class of 25 presents a no more difficult problem than a class of 15 which enrolls children who are feeble-minded, epileptic, incorrigible, or are physically handicapped, as well as those who are merely backward. Vocational training for backward children. However, the administrative aspects of the problem are secondary to the pedagogical. The important task for the school is to provide the kind of instruction suited to the capacity of inferior minds. Whether this is done by grouping the regular class into sections according to ability, or by providing special classes, graded or ungraded, does not greatly matter. The danger inherent in the present costly mode of attack is that we may exhaust all our goodwill on a handful of feeble-minded and leave practically untouched the infinitely larger and more important problem of providing the dull with a kind of training which will make them social and industrial assets. The feeble-minded, in the sense of social incompetence, are by definition a burden rather than an asset, not only economically, but still more because of their tendencies to become delinquent or criminal. To provide them with costly instruction for a few years and then turn them loose upon society as soon as they are ripe for reproduction and crime can hardly be accepted as an ultimate solution of the problem. The only effective way to deal with the hopelessly feeble-minded is by permanent custodial care. The obligations of the public school rest rather with a larger and more hopeful group of children who are merely inferior. It should be clearly understood that individuals of inferior intelligence are not necessarily undesirable members of society. Indeed, the world has abundant use for them. A large proportion of the tasks in the modern organization of industries can be as well performed by individuals of the 70 or 75 IQ class as by those of superior intelligence, and with more satisfaction in the performance. Mentality of 11 years is ample for ordinary kinds of unskilled labor and many of the semi-skilled trades are within the reach of those who test a year or two higher. To make the most of this grade of ability, however, it must be trained. For children who test below 75 or 80 IQ, genuine vocational training should largely replace the usual curriculum of the upper grammar grades, 
nothing beyond a certain amount of relief to the regular teacher is gained by segregating them in special classes unless their course of study is at the same time vocationalized merely the introduction of a little basketry or other handwork does not serve the purpose although there are occasional happy exceptions to the rule the average special class gives the backward child little but will be of direct service to him in the world often indeed it gives him little or nothing beyond the scope of the regular curriculum the following case is a typical illustration of the school's problem in dealing with overage children m is a portuguese boy of sixteen years we first tested him when he was ten years of age his i q was seventy four he was in the third grade where his work was very unsatisfactory we tested him again when he was fourteen and a half years old and in the sixth grade at this time his mental age was ten five and his i q seventy two as would be expected his work in the sixth grade was very inferior by mental age he belonged in the high fourth or low fifth grade recently m left school at the age of sixteen years after promotion to the seventh grade it is certain that had m remained in school indefinitely he would never have been able to master the work required for graduation from the eighth grade the school which he attended a rural school had done all it could for him by the usual methods his teachers were unusually capable and conscientious he had been given a fair trial at the regular curriculum and in spite of his best efforts for m is an industrious lad he could not make headway with it he goes out into the world with no further equipment from his schooling than the ability to read or write and do the fundamental operations in arithmetic some children who test as low as m would be rated as feeble-minded no psychologist would so classify m intellectually inferior he certainly is but as far as his intelligence goes it is sound about ordinary affairs his judgment is dependable and he is steady industrious and anxious to make good there are probably many kinds of semi-skilled work in which he could succeed for none of these has he received any preparation after nine years in school he faces the world with no vocational asset but his god-given brawn there are approximately a million children like m in the public schools of the united states end of chapter eight of the intelligence of school children read by leon harvey